All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Mark Raffin, who is in Calgary in Canada. How are you doing, Mark? Very well, thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and Mark is from Negotiations uh, Ninja. And that's what we're going to talk about today is is negotiations. So um, let's get let's get straight into it into it, Mark. Um, give me give me your kind of definition of what negotiation and a good negotiation really looks like, as opposed to maybe what most people would interpret a negotiation to be. It's actually a really good question because I feel like a lot of people have a misconception about what negotiation is. Now, mm -hmm. I think if you look at a lot of dictionary definitions, they'll say where two or more parties come together to coordinate or communicate and then come out with a mutually beneficial outcome. My take on negotiation is a little bit different because even if you don't come out with an outcome that's desired or you walk away, I should say, that's still a negotiation. You are still negotiating. Just because you didn't come to a deal doesn't mean a negotiation hasn't happened. And in fact, the vast majority of people feel like they should make deals, even if those deals are not in their best interests. And that's a very dangerous position to put yourself in because now you are succumbing to a lot of potential manipulation. And what ends up happening with a lot of people is they feel like they have to make a deal. And this is primarily a result of poor pipelines. Mm -hmm. and we can get into that kind of conversation sure. later on. But just because you've negotiated and don't come to a deal doesn't necessarily mean you haven't gotten value. Walking away from a bad deal is often significantly better than getting involved into a very bad deal. Yeah. No, it's a great. It, it's an excellent point there, Mark, because I do feel, I mean, obviously, and particularly in sales, like that sometimes people are... You know, if things aren't going that well for you, you're you go into a negotiation feeling that you're in a position of weakness from the get go because you maybe don't feel like you can walk away. That's right, John. Absolutely correct. And I think for a lot of people that fundamentally comes down to their ability to communicate effectively what their needs and wants are in a negotiation. And since we're on a show talking um, to pipeline experts, it's often a result of just having a very poorly developed pipeline uh, and just that the strength of having a good pipeline is something that cannot be uh, overstated enough. Yeah. And, and to that point, Mark, I think the, the problem with and, and you would know this better than I, but the problem with a lot of negotiation is is the fact that the work wasn't done properly up front in the early yes. stages of the engagement. Uh, because you know we we love to move things along the pipeline along our our pipeline very fast. So, but not doing the fundamental foundational work at the beginning and figuring out a lot of these things, the stuff that's going to come up in negotiations will come up because you didn't address them earlier. Yeah, and I think that's a factor of people not setting the right expectations as well uh, early on in the discussion with whomever they are trying to negotiate with, and I think. For a lot of salespeople, the concern that I have and the issue that I see is that because we are inevitably such people pleasers, we, we want to please our customers. We want to give them the things that they need to be able to secure the deal. We end up losing track of what we need out of the deal mm -hmm. to make the deal make sense for us. And the result of this, of course, is that people end up with suboptimal deals because we end up sacrificing so many of the things that we need and want in order to really cater to the needs and wants of the people that we are negotiating with. And we become order takers and not negotiators and not salespeople. And that's not good for our customer because now they're entering into a deal where we may not necessarily be getting paid enough to give them the best service possible. Mm -hmm. And it's also not good for us because now we're not getting a deal that makes sense. Yeah, and I feel like some people like they may be fantastic in all the other aspects, but I feel that there's there's a, a, a section of people that they just lose confidence and then go or dread the ne negotiations phase. Everything else is fine, but they dread the negotiations phase yeah. and 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 go into a kind of fear based. You know, why 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 do you think people fear that piece so much? 
I think it's a result of a few different things. Um, for a lot of salespeople, I think it's a result of them fearing losing the deal, right? They, they feel like mm -hmm. they're going to lose the account. They're going to lose the opportunity. And I think all of that stems back to this fear of rejection that we all have when it comes to sales and negotiation in general. We all fear someone saying no or someone pushing back on us. And that's a real fear. I mean, that's, that's something mm -hmm. that we all experience to a certain extent. I mean, some more than others. But it's a real thing, and I think it's important to recognize it as a real thing. There's a lot of negotiation instructors that would make you believe that, um, you know, that's not, a, it's, it is a real thing. And the sooner mm -hmm. you can come to terms with that fear and get over that fear, the easier that your negotiation is going to become. And here's the bad news, John. There is no silver bullet to this. There's no magic wand waving. It comes with reps. It comes with repetition and it comes with practice. You need to actively put yourself into situations where you feel like you're going to be rejected. And you may not be able to do that in your job, depending on the volume of deals that you mm -hmm. do on an ongoing basis. But you can do that in your personal life by asking for things where you think you're probably going to get rejected. And in those kinds of situations, dealing with the awkwardness and dealing with the embarrassment and dealing with the ego failure of <laughs> asking for something that you want that's maybe more than you expect to get and getting rejected is probably the single most powerful thing you can do to improve your negotiation skill set. Because once you can get comfortable with the discomfort of asking for more than you expect to get and asking for more than of what you want, it becomes significantly easier to do that where it counts, which is in your job. And that's what separates good negotiators from bad negotiators and separates good sales reps from amazing sales reps. It's just that optimization of the deal. There's so much value that's left on the table that I see so many people, salespeople do because they believe that they're expediting the process by conceding more. And that's very mm. dangerous. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Uh, yeah, expediting the process by um, by exceeding more or or giving away more. Yeah, I it, it, it think that's a fantastic point. And and the other thing I think, uh, Mark, is that I think sometimes that salespeople go into a negotiation or even into a sales process not valuing their own expertise, their own time, what they bring yes. to the table the product and service apart even but even your your value yourself i mean because they just sometimes they just feel like they give and give and give because they just don't have this they don't value themselves enough or communicate their value of self to the other person yeah and i think that's a result of us believing that we're salespeople more than we are guides through the process. Mm -hmm. I had a great conversation with someone the other day that likened the salesperson to the Obi-Wan Kenobi character that exists in Star Wars. And their comment was, you need to be like Obi-Wan to be able to guide your customer who is the Luke Skywalker of the process through the sale. And there are gonna be points where you are going to disagree with your customer because it may not necessarily be the best option and you're going to challenge your customer to select what you believe is the right option for them. And that's a scary proposition for a lot of people to put themselves into because, again, now we're facing ourselves with not necessarily being a salesperson, but being more of a guide to our customer. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the self-perception that exists, I think, with a lot of salespeople is that they because they've classified themselves as a salesperson and not, not really a guide, they, they become transactional. And when you become mm -hmm. transactional, you, you end up pigeonholing yourself into someone who is not value provisioning. And if you're not value provisioning, then you are just an order taker. And that's not a good position to put yourself into. I'd like the salespeople that are listening to think of themselves more as a guide than anything else through the process. Yeah, and I think, uh, Mark, from uh, if you take that perspective, what it helps as well is this idea of we're now 
you know, in our process, we're now entering the negotiations phase and we've, we've neatly segmented everything right here. We have different phases yes. in our process and negotiations is a discrete one. Uh, unlike what you're just talking about there is if you're acting as a guide, the, the negotiation is really woven into the whole process as Very opposed to is. just being a discrete, uh, discrete step at the end. Yeah, well said. And I think that that's what a lot of people miss. They think that negotiation is an activity into and unto itself, whereas negotiation is very much a part of your sales process. You are influencing and persuading throughout. Yes, there's going to be more parts to, especially if you get into a conversation with procurement, mm -hmm. there's going to be significantly more focus on the negotiation aspect of things. But negotiation is a part of the process that you are pursuing as a salesperson. And I think when people start to view negotiation as a part in sort of the way that you said it, I think was fitted into the process and not as a separate process, then it becomes mm -hmm. easier to visualize that. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. And I think that's where people can avoid, uh, can avoid a lot of issues. And the other thing too, um, Mark, is I feel when often when people go into negotiations, you know, they get uptight from the get go, right? They get a little tense, they get a little. Yeah. Um, how can people turn this around to where they actually, because I mean, you do this for a living. You, you love and you love negotiating, right? I mean, you, you think it's the greatest thing in the world. Why can't other people feel that way? I think negotiation often is conflated with conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, when they think of negotiation, they inevitably think of the conflict that may arise from a negotiation discussion. And conflict for a lot of people isn't fun. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, for the vast majority of people, conflict isn't fun. And so I think when you come into it with that mindset, naturally, you're going to feel anxious and you're going to feel nervous and you're going to feel a, a lot of trepidation um, when you do that. Negotiation does not have to equal conflict. Yes, there are parts of negotiation that may result in conflict, but conflict also isn't necessarily a bad thing. Just because I disagree with someone respectfully and politely mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that we now need to push that to the extreme of everyone shouts and bangs mm -hmm. on the table, which is where a lot of people's minds go when they think of like the extreme version mm -hmm. of conflict or the extreme version of negotiation. And it, it very, very rarely gets to that point. And as long as you are approaching your negotiations respectfully, politely, and courteously, the vast majority of the time, everything is going to be okay. You may have a few outliers here and there where conflict does occur. And this will happen as part of your career. You will get to something like that. But it's very rare, very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I feel that uh, and I feel that when there is conflict or whatever in a negotiation, it is because of miscommunication or misunderstanding or things that haven't been addressed um, earlier in the process. Uh, so how? Do, so one of the things, obviously, for a successful negotiation is to make sure all the time that you're validating with the other person that you're understanding each other because i feel yes. that's where a lot of negotiation goes on it goes uh, off the rails is when people are just talking at cross purposes yeah well spotted i think that a lot of people make assumptions about what has been agreed to and this is where a lot of negotiations go really really badly really really quickly because we believe that when someone nods, that that's actually agreement, and it's not. And so uh, something that you spotted well was the whole idea of when you hear something or see what you see as, a, as an agreement from someone, make sure that that's actually an agreement. Paraphrase back to the person what you think you heard. And say it in those words. Be so bold as to say, hey, I'm going to paraphrase back what I think I heard you say just to make sure that we're on the same page because I want to make sure that we are consistently and constantly ensuring that we are in agreement about what's going on in this conversation. Does that make sense? Yes, no, mm -hmm. perfect. Then I paraphrase back what that person has said. 
I get their agreement or their disagreement on what I think they said or what I think that they, they agreed to. And then we move on with the remainder of the discussion. Now, if they disagree with the, what I've paraphrased, that's perfect. That's exactly the kind of situation that I wanted to create because now we can clear up any kind of misunderstanding that I may have in the negotiation for what they may have said or what they may have agreed to. And ensuring that you're doing that and documenting that, very, very important, along the process is critical to ensure that you get to the end where everyone's like, okay, we're all on the same page. Okay, scope is this, price is this, terms are these, fantastic. Now we can actually put an agreement together that makes sense for both parties. But unless you're constantly ensuring that everyone's on the same page at all times, it becomes very challenging to put to, together an agreement that makes sense. And then what ends up happening is six months down the line, change orders start inevitably happening and we get ourselves into very sticky situations. Yeah, no, no, I love that. And I think that's a really important takeaway is to record as you go and to validate as you go what you think was agreed upon because yeah you're correct um so then how do you uh, in a situation i say you get through the initial negotiations everything's going fine or whatever and then you get sent to that dreaded organization known as the procurement people and that's basically everybody i'm from the dark side so i I can speak educated about this because let's face it, most people, when they engage with procurement, they think, oh, procurement, they're just going to try and drive the price down. That's their only reason to be. So what is your, so how do you approach uh, procurement? Procurement needs to be involved as much as possible from the beginning of the discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is incredibly important because I'll let you in on a little bit of inside baseball with how procurement is often, not always, but often treated within their own organization. Often, procurement is seen as a barrier or a bottleneck to the speed at which the work can be done within Mm -hmm. an organization. But procurement's main function is to ensure that the organization makes the correct buying decision. Notice I said the correct buying decision, not the lowest mm-hmm. price buying decision, right. not the fanciest widgets buying decision, the correct buying decision, meaning the, the, mo- the lowest risk, what we think is a fair price or the best price for what it is we're getting, not the lowest price, the best price for what we're getting. And also the thing that the customer, our customer, who is the same customer as the salesperson, is Um, wants and needs from the product or the service that they're buying. In the process, we have to go through a lot of validation to Mm -hmm. ensure that that's actually happening. And so the earlier that you involve procurement within that process, the easier it becomes to ensure that both parties, our organization and their organization, are getting best value from the deal, a a mutually beneficial agreement. If you wait and don't ask for procurement to be involved until much later in the conversation, then what inevitably ends up happening is they get involved late, and as a result, they have no idea what's going on within what's been agreed to, what hasn't been agreed to, why this business wants to do business with us, and then they're caught on the back foot and the reaction that they mm-hmm. obviously will have as would anyone when they're involved sure. late in the process is not great and yeah. we put ourselves into that position by not requesting and ensuring that procurement is brought into the process earlier i know it's very frightening to try and get procurement in earlier but it's going to make a significantly better deal long term because procurement's going to be able to help guide through that process and it's going to make better value for both organizations. Yeah, and and I guess um I guess a good takeaway here is it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in your preparation is that early in the process when you engage with your with your prospect it's probably a good idea to find out what the ultimate buying process looks like. And is there somebody like a procurement involved? Because I found in the past that often, you know, people will discover, as you said, discover procurement at the end because they never thought to ask whether they would be involved. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And it depends, look, it it often depends on 
the size of the deal that you're putting yeah. together. It depends on the risk of the deal that you're putting together. If there are some organizations that have very well-defined spend thresholds. So if your deal falls below that spend threshold, oftentimes procurement really doesn't care to get involved because mm -hmm. it may not necessarily be a deal that's big enough for them to warrant right. putting resources towards. However, if you're selling large enterprise deals, most likely procurement is going to get involved. So I, I, would, I would ask ahead just to be sure, just to ensure that you are getting the right people in the discussion because you don't want to wait until the end. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Mark, this has been fantastic. And all of Mark's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Mark, tell us a little bit more about you and Negotiations Ninja. Negotiations Ninja is one of the leading negotiation training companies in the world. We provide um, training to some of the largest enterprise companies in the planet as well. And I would love it if people would listen to our podcast, which is the Negotiations Ninja podcast, can be found wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and reach out to me and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me just by typing in my first and last name. All right. Listen, thanks again, Mark. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much for having me.